Welcome to you today. I'm Paul Peppis, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Haida multimedia artist Michael Nicole Yakalanis. His work has been seen in public spaces, museums, galleries, and private collections around the world. Institutional collections include the British Museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Seattle Art Museum, and the Vancouver Art Gallery. His large sculptural works are part of the public art collections of the Vancouver International Airport, City of Vancouver, City of Kamloops, and the University of British Columbia. Yakalanis became a full-time artist after many decades working as part of the Haida Nation's successful campaign to protect its biocultural diversity. Yakalanis is the descendant of iconic artist Isabella Edenshaw, Charles Edenshaw, and Dolores Churchill, and he had early training from exceptional creators and master carvers. Yakalanis' uh, publications include the best-selling graphic novels Flight of the Hummingbird, Red, a Haida manga, and most recently, Jaj, a Haida manga. Michael Yakalanis gave the first talk in this year's Indigenous Comics Speaker Series on October 11, 2023, hosted by Native American and, and Indigenous Studies and the Comics and Cartoon Studies programs at the University of Oregon. Thank you, Michael, for coming on the show. It's great to have you with us. It, it's pretty amazing to be here. <laughs> So as I mentioned, you are Haida, and you served mm -hmm. as a member of the Council of the Haida Nation, and for many years you were a Haida activist. Mm -hmm. Tell us a bit about your home community of Haida Gwaii and the activism that you participated in. Uh, the archipelago is quite unique. It's 144 islands located immediately south of Alaska and west of Canada, and it has the distinction of being, I believe, the only uh, indigenous peoples and territory in the Western Hemisphere that is outside the uh, territorial waters of the Klamath Nation. We are 27 miles uh, off the beach from Canada. In international law says a 13 mile territorial sea. So that creates a, 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 a sense of distinction in, in a kind of a legal structure. But islands also create a sense of identity. Uh, they, 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 they have us look inward at ourselves and, and really make a distinction between the, the other. Uh, the community is, um, uh, the community I grew up in is, is called Masset, uh, the Greater Masset area, Old Masset, and then the Canadian community of New Masset. Um, separated, uh, uh, consistent with the way indigeneity and, and uh, American society seem to be separated as well, you know, by um, legislation, uh, political, social, economic uh, cleavages. Um, and uh, that's what I, I grew up in, and as a result of the 20 odd years of work that I participated in with many, many other people, that dynamic has shifted substantially where the Canadian community, generally speaking, see the Indigenous community uh, not only as an ally but as a protector. And so the dynamic has shifted and it's become much closer together. It's not perfect. It, I mean, ask an engineer where the perfect bridge is. It just doesn't exist. But it's, it's very evolved for, for comparative to other parts of, of North America. So can you give us a sense of what's distinctive about Haida art? Uh, well, um, Haida art is, a, is, 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 is really a, a very precise language of form, and it deals with uh, elements of, of um, um, notions of compression and expansion, of, of, uh, of uh, a search for symmetry, that perfect balance, which we all know doesn't exist. But as human magicians, we want to depict that. So if you look at Haida art, uh, totem poles, uh, a pretty common example, you'll see uh, a center line and a left and a right side, and they should mirror one another. Um, the, f the undulating line that wraps through the three-dimensional carving as well as the two-dimensional really is our, our effort to depict that which is outside of us, also part of us, and this is where the element of compression and expansion comes in, where the our existence uh, within the world is subject to forces around us, to the context. Um, and uh, I think that is depicted in the art form. And it's very precise language. It has uh, rules 
um, that are hard and fast and the challenge for the artist is to create within those rules. And I th would agree that I've taken those rules and really sharp elbowed them in many ways to make it quite uh, distinctively different than the classic tradition. And my defense for that is, is I believe in tradition, but I believe in the tradition of innovation as, as the driving force. And um, uh, so I've created this thing called, I, I called Haida Manga. So tell us about Haida Manga. What's, what's unusual, what's unique about it, and why did you create it? What made you create it? Well, um, so the, the 20 odd years of activism that saw a coming together of people we would say should be oppositional forces, indigenous people and then new settlers for lack of a, a better word. That uh, it, a decades long experience taught me that the uh, cleavages I had assumed existed didn't really exist. That settler people, white people uh, uh, um, cannot be described as uh, entirely as colonizers and you know and predatorial forces that's a pretty strong and accurate characteristic of the body writ large but it, it can't apply to individuals and so learning that propelled me on to try to take this high iconic form of art that is Haida and make it accessible to some degree to the other thinking that if we have a better appreciation and better communication, we won't be so nasty to one another. And um, the term Haida Manga actually speaks to a historical relationship that Haida's and, in, in true, many indigenous people, particularly men along the Pacific Northwest Coast, including Washington State, uh, would travel to Asia during a time when racism was just the way it was. Uh, no, sir, you cannot use this toilet because you're an Indian. You can't eat here because you're an Indian, et cetera, et cetera. In Japan, that didn't exist. Relatives, uh, ancestors of mine came back talking about how wonderful it was to be able to walk into a restaurant, into a clothing store, and, and just be a human. And so I, that was the story I grew up with. And then I had to reconcile that with this other story of of uh, you know the attack on on Chinese men who built the the Americas, they built that railway, and then when that job was done, the United States couldn't get rid of them fast enough, and um, and then the Second World War and, and you know the demonizing of, the, of Japan, I was trying like these things don't make sense, and then when I looked at it, I said you know I'm going to acknowledge this historical moment, and say thank you to Japan for being a refuge for people in my life. So the term Haida Manga came up and the connection between indigenous people and uh, non-indigenous people through the art form um, became uh, comics uh, driven because it's such a populist and accessible uh, medium. So you've already begun to talk about this, but one of the many distinctive features about of uh, Haida Manga is its transformation of what comics people call the gutter. That's the white mm. space between the geometrically arranged panels on a comics page. So how and why does Haida Manga transform the gutter? It's boring, for one thing. <laughs> just, just want to put that out there. You know, it's another white space, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a colored cosmos, if you will. Um, but there's a number of things. The, the square, the rectangular sort of angular geometry of the gutter, if you zoom back, it, it looks like a map for a suburb, right? Here's where we're going to put the sewer and the water. And, and, and when we do that, do we also consider the people that live in those spaces? And what are the kind of re complex relationships that may not be served by uh, 200 meters of sewer line will cost us uh, this much, so we're, you know, anyway, so, so there's that kind of thing. I think it reflects the, the, the sort of cultural propensity to grid the planet, to grid the cosmos, to, to organize everything uh, in ways that, that we're comfortable with, as opposed to saying, uh, what's there now? 
and how can I adapt myself to that situation? No, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to slam my rules onto the landscape. The other thing that I find really problematic is the gutters work as a, as a representation of time and space, and we think we all understand it. It bothers me that we depict it as empty. And I think that's quite dangerous because it says, I'm the only important thing here. And anything outside this little story in the panel is really of no consequence. And that mythology is probably why we are facing the uh, existential threat that, that is looming, is ecosystem collapse. Um, because we think nothing else matters except what I, I want to do. So that sort of arrogance is very dangerous. And so I, I reject that. I, I just think, look, um, no, I reject it, but, but more to the point, I think we should look at it and see for, honestly for, for what it says. And then other people can accept or reject. Uh, we're all sovereign people. I'll let other people make up their own mind. My position is it's, it's actually quite harmful to see the world that way. So the first graphic narrative, uh, your first graphic narrative in book form, The Flight of the Hummingbird, was published in 2008. And it's become a talisman for environmentalists and activists. What should we know about that book? What's important about that book? Oh, that's a, that's a good one. Um, so the story is, 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 um, is of a bird that is dropping water over a forest fire, a very small bird, a hummingbird. And uh, the question that this asks in this very short parable for the environment is, what are you doing? Uh, that's a fire, baby. You know, that's a forest fire, and you're a hummingbird, and you're putting what? A bead of water on the fire. I mean, it just seems stupid, foolish. But the story ends with the hummingbird's response to that question is, I do what I can. And I th there's, there's a magic to that. The magic is the story ends there, and we don't know whether the hummingbird is shish kebobbed. We don't know if the fire is put out because actually it's irrelevant. What is important is moving into action. Now back to this question you had about the gutters. We, we think that if we lay the gutters out in our world out in this way that we can manage for the foreseeable future and beyond, that we are, we are gods and, and we can do this um, uh, control and, and, and management of structures we don't even understand. I think the greatest model is forest management. I've yet to run into anybody who can explain to me how a forest operates, a yeah, 14,000 year old creature. But, so I think that the story, what's important about the flying hummingbird is it's a call for action. The hummingbird cannot predict its action, uh, the, you know, the implications for its action, but it's going to do what it can. And that's, that's liberating, right? We don't have to we don't have to think way, way ahead. We just move and move quickly because the opportunities to engage in any particular moment is a moment. You don't often have time to do a lot of research. Um, sometimes you just have to, you know, grab that baby out of the fire. You, sometimes you, you just have to grab that car and lift it up to release the person underneath. And if you were to stop and say, well, that car weighs, you know, so many tons and I'm, I can't do it. But we have stories of people actually doing that because they're moving into the moment. And I think it's liberating and, um, um, and it's available to us all. And so the flight of the hummingbird does what it can. And tell a little bit about the story of um, how you got this book to um, have a special endorsement. Oh, yeah. Um, so, so the book did very well in, in Japan. And uh, my contribution with the graphics, I mean, there were other very important Japanese uh, writers uh, contributing to the success of this little book. Koben Shaw, a very large publication, uh, started the presses early in the morning. They were going to run a, a run of 20,000 copies. They were all sold out by noon. So, th and the coverage on the television, and uh, at the same time Al Gore was on, and there's a lot of little stories about the impact it had. And so when I came back to, to North America, 
the publishers were, had, who had never paid any attention to me previously were wondering, how do you get to be a number three bestseller in Ap Amazon Japan? <laughs> and so they were definitely wanting to do something. <laughs> and they said, uh, we need what's in the, in the industry called a big mouth. We need someone to chat it up, right? Brand recognition. And I, I thought it was kind of foolish, but what do I know? And the, so we're sitting there, we're throwing names out. I think we threw a, a, a couple of um, Californian governor's names out, you know, and they were just all rejected. So finally, in frustration, I just said, the Dalai Lama. <laughs> and uh, uh, Rob, the, the publisher, said, well, you know, do you know the Dalai Lama? <laughs> and I said, no, I, I don't actually. But right now, the chances of him writing a foreword for a book are zero. But if we ask, we must at least uh, get to a 50%, you know, he's either going to say yes or he's going to say no. And I like that increase in the odds. So we asked, and much to our surprise, the Dalai Lama said yes. <laughs> Which means that I can no longer get the book printed in China. Yeah, so I, I, I'm probably on the right side of the question there, but <laughs> it was just asking, right? It was, uh, and, and it, it happened to work. So your most recent graphic narrative is Jaj Ahida Manga. What led to its creation? And tell us about the book. Uh, the Humboldt Forum, which is Europe's largest cultural project, I think the price was 650 billion euros or some amazing grand number beyond my imagination. I, I might have the number wrong. It was huge. Uh, they sent curators out to, um, to the Pacific Northwest in part because their collections include probably the most, certainly one of the most significant collections of cultural objects from this part of the world in the late 1800s. And uh, so they wanted, they were they're trying to figure out a relationship, a new type of relationship between the people, the source culture for those objects, and themselves as a Western institution. And um, that's a hard piece of work. And, and uh, so they approached me and asked if I would uh, do, a, do something. Can, can, I, can I come up with an idea? And I, I proposed a mural, an eight square meter mural uh, painted on uh, Kozowashi, Japanese paper, about a man who pulled that collection together, whose name was Johann Adrian Jacobson, the initials for the title, and um, discovered that Jacobson and I share some connection in terms of my own uh, hybrid ancestry, um, um, which includes n n Norwegian uh, families from the same part of the country that Jacobson came from. And this was not anything I knew when I took the commission. This was quite a surprise, Paul, in the middle of this uh, project. I'm going to describe this nasty collector coming across with uh, intent to grave rob and, and steal and, you know, cajole and take all the goodies away and leave us destitute. I mean, that's, I don't really believe that ever to be, but to make the, the, the case, nasty collector. And as I started going deeper into his story and realizing that we had these similarities, I had to open my mind to a, a bit of more sympathetic uh, point of view and ultimately as we did the research and I had five researchers working on this we discovered that Jacobson perhaps had not been treated fairly by the German institution um, and so then the story became about Jacobson's wish to establish himself in the world uh, but as a Norwegian whose German wasn't very good working for a leading German institution he felt that he was the other apart from, separate. And when he came to this part of the world, I have him meet uh, my great-great-grandfather who had just discovered that his father was also European. And, um, and George, the great-great-grandfather, wonders if his European father is one of the plague men. You know, the use of smallpox as, as, a, as a tool of, of a weapon, and discovers, no, quite the contrary. His great-grandfather, who was Jewish, was the only people 
in, the, in, in that part of the world that spoke out against the British use of smallpox and attack on indigenous people. At their own peril, I would say, because at that time, Jews were being murdered in Europe. And I just wondered about that. And so these parts came together uh, consistent with what I had learned in my own life as, as an activist, that you find friends in unexpected places. So the story shifted quite a bit and I started to explore these kind of uh, relationships and assumptions that get in the way of better understanding. Um, the mural is in Humboldt form in Berlin and we have turned it into a graphic novel or a comic book as well. Uh, heavily footnoted uh, because I think it's important for people to look at that history, the 1880s. A lot of American history in there. Um, um, it's an opinion piece, and that's why I want to put the footnotes in. I let other people decide whether or not they agree with, with, with how I saw the world at that time. So you mentioned that it was commissioned as a mural. Yes. But you also have made it into a comic book. Yes. Why? Uh, so when I started off on this career path, coming from a, a family and a culture that creates monumental works, totem poles, they're huge. They're, um, uh, you know, it's a 800-year-old cedar tree, and the, the designing and the production, the carving, these are immense projects. And uh, not everybody can afford a totem pole, right? There's a few people in the world who can. Uh, it, I'm not one of them, but institutions can. So institutions are, are um, always happy to have Haida monumental art. And, uh, but I was trying to speak to to regular people with wallets more similar to mine, <laughs> with the whole idea of making of taking comics and merging it with Haida art, and I suddenly realized I'm building these eight or twelve square meter paintings that are going in huge institutions. How does that speak to the common person? And and I started realizing that I was f being seduced or falling into this monumental category and so I, I that it was at that point I thought I can do both. I can create the artwork, the institution can buy the artwork, in the process they can actually finance all the necessary design work required to create a book that is available to people who might be able to afford you know thirty dollars or, or hopefully even less. I'm, tr I'm trying to figure out how to drive the price down even more because the Citizens of this country, the United States, and just and generally citizens of Canada need to be more engaged in this question about what is the quality of their relationship to their neighbor. That it cannot continue to be filtered by invested um, uh, agents, uh, whether they be economic or, or political. And, and there's, a, there's a sinister element to manipulating regular people, honest people who you know, raise children and, and live honest lives and try to do good in their life and have good moral principles of not doing harm and, and, and uh, to others. Th those are the people that need to, to stand up to the fore in this, this period where we see the rise of fascism. Uh, the tensions in the United States are alarming for your neighbors to the north and, uh, and other places. And the way to cut through that is to, is to go deeper. Uh, I, I believe, you know, to people, because people are inherently decent. People want to do the good thing. Um, there's forces at work that want us to do the good thing for them, and never mind the impacts on us or our children. So books and comic books is the solution. It is the self. It is the inoculation to the disease that we seem to be suffering. So you've just talked about um the experience of seeing Judge as a mural in Berlin and the experience of reading the comic book, Judge. Um, you, at the end of all of your Haida Manga, you'll have a little note that says, if you go buy two copies of this. So tell us about that. <laughs> so, you know, I think we, we kind of come to the point where we look to the voice of authority to tell us what it is that we're seeing, what is it we're experiencing, is it good or bad? and. Um, and an artist can fit into that uh, role quite nicely. 
um, a, a paint a picture. Uh, there'll be a title at the bottom. There'll be a name. There'll be a little tagline. It'll tell you what you're looking at. And um, what happens is the observer becomes separate from the experience. Someone is manufacturing uh, your experience for you for their ends. And I think that that erasure of our personal sovereignty is, is, is a dangerous thing. I mean, there are times when we need to, to look to expertise, uh, physicians, for example, right? I mean, I don't want my mechanic to, to, to you know, <laughs> heal my broken leg. I, but, but generally, there is a need for people to become more responsible. One of the ways that, that, that I've uh, suggested people could do this is to take two copies of the book and cut it up. And I would say to the librarian who is now recoiling from the screen, it's not like it's the only book. We've got thousands of them. But what happens is in the process, as people participate in creating things, they can take two copies of the book and they can piece the pages together and they can duplicate the mural that lives in the Humboldt Forum. Or closer to home, the mural that lives in the Seattle Art Museum. So it's an invitation for people to it's not destruction, cutting up the book. It's recreation. And, and they can see themselves as artists and you know, admire their... No one has done it uh, really uh, to the extent that I've, I've requested, but some people have, have done cutting up the books. Hmm. Yeah. So you talk about um, having the viewer be reflected in the art. Yeah. So that makes me think about your Coppers from the Hood series. Yeah. So tell us about that series. What is that? What, what does it mean to say coppers from the hood? Why, do you, why is that what it's called and what are those right. works like? Well, a copper is a, is a, is a monetary unit um, uh, here in the United States, uh, as it used to be in Canada, and as it is in, in Haida society. It's, it's a, a different type of measure of value, um, um, but nevertheless it is a measure of value. So coppers um, are these large copper discs that are still manufactured and presented and, and displayed in, in public events. Uh, they have names and they're gifted and they represent the um, transition from material wealth to incorporeal wealth in, in, in the Haida system. Not how many pennies I've got and then I can buy this other object. No, it's, it, it, it releases us from the physicality to, to, to a different world. So the hood is a, is a reference to neighborhoods and it's also uh, a reference to car hoods. Um, I um, once took a, a very important uh, artifact, a canoe, I was asked uh, by a museum to do something in, in the space and I said, can I take the canoe? And they said, why? And I said, well, if it was just a regular canoe and I wanted to go to the beach, I take that canoe and I put it on my car and I drive to the beach. So how about we take it off this sacred dais, this plinth that you've got and put it on a car? And you know, the, they agreed finally. Um, so when I was looking at the car, I was admiring the, the design, the, you know, the aerodynamics, and, and I was looking at the canoe and saying the hydrodynamics of the form. So I was really excited by the aesthetics. And then I, I started taking parts from, from automobiles and using them as surfaces. And uh, I used the Toyota Yaris um, in part because of the, the beautiful shape of the hood, which looks like a canoe. And I come from canoe culture. But also because Yaris is a Somali word, which means that which is greater than what it appears to be. And we encase these in copper, layer them with lacquers, paint on top of them, and you know, they're really sparkly. You know, so the aesthetics, it's, it's, it's quite, quite lovely. And there is a piece in the Met, the British Museum, uh, Denver Art Museum. Um, you know, they're, they've, they've actually seemed to grab onto something. And, and I was a wee bit surprised by it, actually. But they're beautiful things. And um, uh, yeah, coppers from the hood. Um, tell us about the one in the Met. Why is that one important? Well, that one is done with a platinum leaf, and it's a tercel. Now, a tercel is a type of hawk, and my European relatives uh, have a red hawk. A tercel is a red hawk as a design, so I, I'm speaking to myself with choice of the hood there. Um, 
I, I think the thing that I really like about that one was in conversations with the Met, they were looking to acquire this piece. I made it a requirement that they couldn't put it in the ethnic section. And I said, if you got to put it in the ethnic section, you, you, don't, you don't want it because you're not going to get it. I want the work to be seen as art, not indigenous art, Art created by somebody of, of diverse hybrid ancestry, which includes indigenous, but it's this kind of ethnic uh, salve. Or is it supposed to make things different or something? Can't I be an artist first? And so uh, they, they did agree. And the wonderful thing about it, Paul, was when they mounted it, and they mounted it for a long time in the hallway, it was uh, outside the ethnic uh, section, in the contemporary art section, but across the wall was soul of wit. And, and, you, and if you stood and looked at the hood that I did, this pathetic little piece of work next to this masterpiece, you could see his work reflected in the hood because it, you know, it's so reflective. So I, um, I, was, I really appreciate that they would agree to that because it's important for me, for us to uh, um, take some of the adjectives away Never mind what kind of human. You're human? Yeah, okay, you're, you're my same species. You're not red, you're not blue, you're not colored or whatever, you know. It's, yeah, so that, that's a nice piece. And I think kudos to, um, to um, I think it was Sheila Wagstaff, who, or Sheena Wagstaff, I, I'm sorry, uh, who led that way along with a curator by the name of Ian Altavir. You know, so I, I thought that was quite progressive of them. It's the only piece by an indigenous artist in the Met, which is in the contemporary art collection. Is that I, correct? I believe so, yeah. Well, Michael, that's, um, I wish that we could keep talking forever, but we can't. Okay. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. It's just been completely fascinating. I want to urge our viewers to go out and buy your comics and to go to these various museums, the Seattle Art Museum, the Met in New York, the Vancouver Art Museum, to see your amazing work. Thank you. Thanks for talking. <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. Thank you. Um, I've been speaking with Haida multimedia artist Michael Nicole uh, Yakalanis. He gave the first talk in this year's Indigenous Comic Speaker Series on October 11th, 2023, hosted by the Native American and Indigenous Studies Program and the Comics and Cartoon Studies Program at the University of Oregon. Thanks so much for watching. <laughs>